Hey guys, this is Andrew. Welcome back to the channel. So yesterday was International Day of People with a Disability. I posted a short that's still gaining traction, so you'll be seeing a lot more shorts from me at the moment. But um, I did a lot of did something a bit different. Um, shine a light up to hold to account those who are supposed to protect those with people with disability, but have ended up harming them. And so let's jump in. Um, that aside, in Australia we've made amazing strides, but we've got a long way to go. But enough with the tangents, so let's drive straight in. So this one is going to be on how to, where you can go and how to complain to be effective without being yet labelled as, a, I've seen a really great term, a yelly over on LinkedIn. So just a side note, a yelly is someone who is a thorn in someone's side in the disability sector who, because the disability sector is still struggling with, it is the client's control. There may be some things that the client needs help with in the way of decision making, but at the end of the day, the NDIS is about the client's choice control and dignity of risk. So guides, I've got the playlist, that I'll link on an end down below on reasonable and necessary and NDIS decoded but this is kind of interesting of where you can go to complain. Um, the first one is to consider whether it's worth complaining or not. Is it something that will resolve on its own? So I said the thing is the first decision you have to make because there might be extenuating circumstances that you're not aware of with policies and procedures that can seem a bit restrictive to you. So the first thing is your service provider. So whether that's a private support worker, whether that's an allied health team, but the service provider themselves and verbal complaint I have found through experience does not generally work well. So be prepared to put it in writing. If you're not prepared to put it in writing, you have to question why. Um, and having it signed by a JP, you can often find them in your local shopping centres, JPs in the communities um, as well, will often help get the complaint noticed. Then your second one is getting family and friends as well because oftentimes people and service providers will have the policy of believing support workers over clients and that might be because of clients' behaviours and attitudes in the past as well. Um, what might seem a big deal to us isn't a big deal to them in the big picture. but. This is where person-centred practice comes in of listening and addressing that person's concerns. Then obviously if that doesn't work there is the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission and there is actually confidential support and counselling to be able to do that as well. We've also seen the Royal Commission um, I do know time to tell your story is running out, but the Safeguards Commission. And then last and but not least at all, and is going to the local police, but do this with caution as well. So if it is criminal behaviour, you need to speak up and have that recorded to the police. Um, because speaking up is the only way that we're going to fix this behaviour because statistically it's actually service providers and support workers who are more likely to harm a client and there is a big focus on minimising harm at the moment but it's actually statistically a care provider that is likely to harm through either passive support or actively harming that client um, harm here I'm talking about not only physical harm but emotional harm 
So saying something without thinking about it that might trigger a person over the edge, that might spiral them. Um, assuming that a person can do things that they can't do. Um, putting the person in a bad financial position or forcing them into restrictive practices that aren't appropriate for them. So guys, please like, share and subscribe and I'll do another video on breaking down harm in disability and what's the difference between harm, abuse as well. So guys, I'll see you guys in the next video.